you so much and good evening to everybody who's joined us it's been just so wonderful seeing people pop up from all over the world and thank you so much for this platform i think that you guys have done an incredible job to share conservation widely through through this network so really well done to all of you it gives me great pleasure to introduce two people um that I respect their work. I like them both as people. And in fact, I actually love one of them quite a lot. So today I'm going to introduce Dr. Bruce Mann and Gareth Jordan, both of whom work or have worked in Bruce's case at the Oceanographic Research Institute, which is part of the South African Association for Marine Biological Research based in Durban. Bruce has worked there since 1992 until he recently took early retirement in February 2023, but he's stayed as a research associate with ORI and he is still helping the team. His research is really focused on sustainable use and looking after our fisheries more effectively and he's got a special passion for marine protected areas. He has been associated with the Oceanographic Research Institute's Cooperative Fish Tagging Program since its inception in 1984. So he's just the right person to tell us about the fish tagging project. And he has tagged well over 5,000 fish in his life. So he really knows what he's talking about. Gareth has been with ORI since 2014, and he started off there where he earned his Master's of Science at uh, ORI, and he is now actually the Assistant Scientist, and he is the Tagging Officer, a role that he's had since 2018, and his job is really the management of the tagging program, so he'll be able to tell you all about how the program's managed and be able to answer all of those management-related questions. So I think that we're in really good hands. We're with two people who are absolutely passionate about the ocean, they're passionate about fish, but most importantly, they're actually passionate about people and helping people to take care of our fish through the tagging program. So I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to pass over to Bruce and to Gareth, over to you guys. Thanks, Judy. Great, thank you, Judy. That was a wonderful introduction. Ah, thanks, Gareth, and thank you, everyone, um, for, for joining us this evening. Um, we're looking forward to giving you an exciting presentation about the Oceanographic Research Institute's Cooperative Fish Tagging Project, um, which has now been running for 38 years. And uh, yeah, we've got some exciting stuff in store for you. So next, next one. Thanks, DJ. Right, so I think the first question is, why do we tag tag fish? Um, and I see there are a couple of, of birders in the audience tonight. It's very much like bird ringing. Um, really what fish tagging is about is to, to try and understand fish movement patterns, where they move to. Um, <clears throat> we get information about the growth of fish and also something about the population dynamics. So it's a very important technique that's, that's used in fishery science. And just by way of two little examples, the map on the bottom left, you can see some movements of diamond rays along the South African coast that we published recently with the, I'll have to look carefully, the red arrows are, are fish that have moved up to KwaZulu-Natal and the blue arrows are fish that have moved back down to the Cape. On the bottom right, you'll see a graph which is showing a, 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 a trend and, and a whole lot of observed data points. This is the, the growth rate of, of king mackerel. Um, or, or kuta as we call them in the tell. And <clears throat> when you catch a, catch a fish and tag it, you measure it. And if it's ever recaptured again, you measure it again. You know how long that fish has been at liberty for. So from the, the length at, at tagging and length at recapture, you can work out the growth rate um, of the fish. And that's what's plotted in that graph. And you can see as the fish get bigger, the growth rate slows down, which is a typical uh, phenomenon in fish that the, as you get to adulthood, the growth slows down. Thanks, TJ. Right, so how do, how do we tag? So the, the ORI tagging project really focuses on using what we call dart tags or spaghetti tags, just because they look a little bit like a piece of spaghetti. Um, and essentially the way they're used is they're inserted into 
uh, a needle-like applicator. It's a hollow stainless steel applicator that you slide the tag into. And the main two types of tags that we use are the D tag, the one at the top, and the slightly bigger A tag. Um, and they have a unique number on each tag, one just near the point at, under the barb there, and one near the end of the tag. It's the same number, but that's a unique tag number that um, <clears throat> if it's inserted into the fish, um, it can be, re re if it, it's recaptured, we know what that fish has done. On the tag itself now, we have a, our email address and Gareth carries that phone with him at all times. So you can contact him if you catch a um, tagged fish. We've also got our email address um, on that tag. Historically, you'll see on the A tag below, we used to use our postal address, but um, because of the, the kind of uh, what's happened to the South African post office, we've, we've done away with, with using that. And I'll chat a bit more about that just now. So just very briefly, if you look at the bottom left, um, that's a cat face rock cod that I'm tagging. The way we tag them is uh, <clears throat> to insert the tag just below the, the dorsal fin into the, into the mus mus musculature of, of the fish. Um, normally towards the end of the dorsal spines is the ideal sweet spot. Um, you carefully remove a scale away with the tip of the applicator and then insert the tag um, where, into that spot where the, the, the scale came out and you push it in through the muscle and lock it behind one of the pterygia fours or, or neural spines so that the, the barb hooks in place. Um, we do this at an angle of about 50 degrees so that the, the tag is not too flat, otherwise it rubs along against the fish and creates a wound. In the middle picture at the bottom, tagging sharks very similar, uh, because they've got such um, tough skin, you need to first pierce the skin with a little um, piercing tool, which we do have available in our tagging kits, or you can use um, a clean, that little spark on a Swiss army knife just to pierce the skin and then you insert the, the tag into the muscle under the dorsal fin. Um, and then obviously in the case of, of big fish like marlin, you don't want to bring them on, on board. You want to keep them in the water and some boats have quite a high gunnel. So in that case, we'll use a tagging pole um, and the tag is inserted into the shoulder of the, of the billfish um, just under the dorsal fin, as you can see there. Thanks, Gareth. So, um, for me, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of, of tagging um, <clears throat> at Ori tonight. And it was really started off by Dr. David Davies and John Bass um, in the 1960s on a tagging project on dusky sharks, um, looking at the movement of dusky sharks along the KwaZulu Natal coast. Um, and to do this, they used a tag which is very like a, a cattle ear tag. And the way it's, it's, it's put on is you use, you can see in the top right there, there's a little leather punch under that lady's hair. So you, you clip um, a little hole in the dorsal fin and then the, the two, the male and the female side of the tags are clipped together and that tag um, has a, a unique number on it and a return address. And then the shark is, is released. So that was already happening um, by the, the sort of early 1960s that Ori was involved in, in tagging sharks. Next one. This was followed um, <clears throat> in the 1970s by Rudy van der Elst, who, who joined Ori in the late 1960s. And he was very interested in, in what uh, the Americans were doing and the Australians were doing with bullfish and, and their tagging projects. So together with the Sodwana Bay Ski Boat Club, um, they started the, the first bullfish tagging in, in South Africa, up at, up at Sodwana, using a tagging pole um, and um, Floyd tags, I think they were from America at that time. Thanks, Gareth. Um, <clears throat> the next one along the line is a very interesting story. Um, and I think many of our, our coastal anglers know something about the story. And that was to do with, with the very popular shad or elf as it's known um, down in the Cape. Um, a very popular angling fish for shore anglers right along the Eastern seaboard of South Africa. But in <clears throat> the late 1970s, when Rudy was doing his master's work on the species, uh, there was quite a controversy about its management, and people didn't know if the 
the shed or the elf down in the Cape was the same stock or the same animal that they were catching up along the KZN coast. Um, so to try and understand what was going on, um, Rudy started a project tagging shed and um, uh, Simon Chater um, in the bottom right there helped him on this project and they tagged many thousands of shed along the South African coast using a T-bar tag. Um, this is pretty much like, you know, when you, you buy a new piece of clothing in the clothing store and it has the price on it and it's got a, like a little T, uh, plastic T tag that you pull out of the clothing, exactly the same thing. Um, and it's inserted using a little um, tagging gun and you can see that at the top right there and it's inserted into the pre percal groove. That's the groove just in front of the gill slit. And there's a membrane there um, that the little T part of the tag sits behind. Um, and then there are a couple of tags shared in a, in a porter pool that you can see bottom left with the, the little um, opercle tags next to them in yellow then. And those tags would also have a number and an address. Um, so from that project, um, they found that a number of the fish that they tagged down in the Cape were recaptured up in KwaZulu-Natal. And similarly, fish that they tagged along the Natal coast were caught down in the Cape. So from that work, they were able to um, basically say that it's the same stock and we can manage shared um, using the same um, regulations, bag limits and size limits. So it was an important project. Thanks, Gareth. And that really brought us to where, where we are now, which was the start of the, of the ORI Cooperative Fish Tagging Project. And um, Rudy was the brainchild of, of this project um, <clears throat> and has sort of put it together. And what it was is, as I've written there on the screen, a collaborative citizen science project between scientists, anglers, and anglers to collect information on fish movement patterns, on their growth rates, and population dynamics to help ensure their wise and sustainable use to create and to create awareness amongst anglers. So <clears throat> Eleanor Bullen, who I'm sure some of you will remember, and I hope Eleanor is with us tonight. I didn't see her in, in coming in, um, but she was our first tagging officer from 1984 to 2010 and did, did a tremendous job. And some of you might have seen Stuart Dunlop a little bit earlier this evening. He's listening, so welcome, Stuart. Um, he was our tagging officer from 2011 to 2018, um, and I've managed the project um, since about 2003. Thanks, Gareth. So just basically to take you through the, the process of how this, how this project works, very simply, an angler can contact us and, and apply to become, to become a tagging member. We have a screening procedure just so that we ensure that the, the anglers that join are really um, avid anglers, that they, they're really interested, they want to, they fish a lot, and they're going to contribute something to the project. Otherwise, people just think it's a nice idea, and then we basically end up wasting a lot of money by sending them kits and that, that never get used. So once you've passed the, the process of application, um, there's a 500 Rand once or fee to join as a member. Um, and for that, you, you receive a tagging kit with a whole lot of nice little toys in it. Most importantly is your tagging applicator and the tags, which are stuck onto little cards with the same um, unique number as each tag. And you can write on those cards, the species that you tag, its length, um, the date that it was tagged and the locality it was tagged and who it was that tagged at your tag number. So that's really important. There's a tape measure in there. There's a little um, cleaning goodie to clean the, the applicator, keep it nice and, and clean to get rid of bacteria. Um, and then very importantly, there's a little memory stick that you get with your tagging kit, which has a tagging manual on it that you, we ask all our new taggers to read through to understand the project. And very importantly, there are, I think, about 15 tagging videos on that, on that memory stick, which explain to you how to catch fish, handle fish, tag fish, different types of fish exactly. So um, very important that, that the new tagger looks at or watches those, those videos before he starts tagging. So the process is really... To once you've got your tagging kit to go to go fishing and, and hopefully catch a nice fish, 
over the years, we've put more and more emphasis on to landing the fish um, so that it's not damaged. So <clears throat> we now have some stretches or, or uh, slings, we call them, to land the fish in. Um, and then you measure the fish carefully, uh, tag the fish, as I've explained, and then release it as quickly as possible. Um, and then record the information, as I've explained. Uh, which is then sent through to Gareth, the tagging officer, who records that information onto our tagging database. And we'll talk a bit more as we go. Thanks, Gareth. So that's uh, the process of tagging. There's quite an interesting story about funding and how that's gone um, over the years. Obviously, Ori being linked to Sambra, as Judy introduced at the, at the beginning, is our, our parent organization has hosted and, and run the tagging project since its um, inception in 1984. But for the first 22 years, we had funding from Cedric's Old Brown Sherry. Um, and those of you who are anglers in the, in the audience will know that um, Old Brown or OBs as we call it, uh, go hand in hand with angling. So it, it was a ro wonderful relationship um, that um, Cedric's and um, as it was called in those days, uh, Stellenbosch Farmers Winery, and now called the Stell, uh, funded the project um, for, for those 22 years. WWF South Africa, um, which was originally the South African Nature Foundation, um, helped with administration of the project for over 10, 10 years. Um, and they assisted when um, Cedric's pulled out um, in 2005 with uh, finding a new body, um, funding body, which was the Tony and Lizette Lewis Foundation, which funded us for, for three years. And following that, um, we approached the, the provincial government in KwaZulu-Natal um, for a grant and aid. And, and very fortunately for us, um, that is still ongoing. And we certainly are very, very grateful for that, that funding that we have received from, from that, that body. Thank you. So yeah, looking at the, at the evolution, it's quite amazing um, at how technology has changed in the, in the last um, 40 years. When Rudy started the project, Eleanor was literally recording every tag release and every tag recapture that we got in a, in a logbook. Um, so then Rudy sort of realized that it was going to be too slow to analyze that all by hand. So he developed a little program on a, a Hewlett Packard handheld computer to help with the analysis. Um, and then in the early 90s, um, Gary and Shelley Burney helped us develop the first um, DOS-based, uh, D-based system, uh, which was a really nice program to, to capture the, all the tagging data on. And now we've moved on to sort of much faster, much bigger um, database systems using MySQL, and we have a web-based system now because of, of the vast amount of data that's been collected on this project um, over the last 38 years. Thanks, Gareth. And similarly, um, as technology has developed, so our communication has improved. Um, <clears throat> in the old days, it was all via stale mail um, using the postal service. So literally, each fish that was tagged was recorded on a tagging card and then posted uh, back to us and uh, the tagging officer would then record that onto the database. Um, that sort of moved into email when email first became available, which sped things up a lot. And now we have an online web-based system where you can literally enter your, your tag releases. And if you catch a, a, a recapture a fish, you can enter it directly online, which makes it much faster and, and much more accurate. Similarly, in the old days, all the, the communication was done via, via telephone, um, but that changed with the, the evolution of cell phones and smartphones. So we went to the SMS system, and now we do a lot via WhatsApp because it's, it's really quick. So a lot of Gareth's time is spent um, communicating with our members um, on WhatsApp. Thanks, DJ. So also the that the equipment that we've used has improved over time. So as I mentioned with that, that original shark tagging project, when we started in 1984 to tag sharks top left there, we were using um, something similar to a cattle ear tag. We called them C tags. 
And um, as I explained, you make a little hole in the dorsal fin and clip the, the male and the female part of that tag onto the fin. But those tags um, had a lot of biofouling. Um, so basically there were things like barnacles and algae, even little sponges attaching themselves onto the tag. Um, that would cause a lot of drag in the water and it would eventually split the fin and the tag would fall out. So it, it wasn't, there was a lot very high tag shedding using that type of tag. So we moved over to, to the, the dart tagging systems as I've explained. And now we import all our tags from um, a company called Hallprint in Australia. And um, I certainly think, and I hope there's some of them listening tonight that they, they produce some of the best, best external fish tags in the world. We really have developed a good relationship with Hallprint and um, their product is, is really excellent. Um, just bottom right there, those are the tags that we now use in the tagging project. The, the M tag at the top there is our marlin tag or bullfish tag, and it's got a double anchor that's inserted into the, into the dorsal musculature as I showed earlier. The B tag is a, a stainless steel headed tag, which is used mostly for sharks. So um, big sharks over 25 kilos, we would use a B tag and that tag is inserted in uh, to, the, to the muscle under the dorsal fin. So it, it sits quite well under, under the skin. And then the, the A and D tags, as I've explained, uh, or the, the bulk of tagging is done with those two tag types. The D tag is used for smaller fish between 30 and 60 centimeters in, in length. We don't tag fish smaller than 30 centimeters because um, they're just too small for the tags that we use. And then A tags are used for fish from 60 centimeters and, and above. The little bottom tag is, is what's called an OTC tag. Um, and that's an orange color as opposed to the yellow of the other tags. And that's just to indicate if we tag the fish with oxytetracycline. Um, the purpose of doing that is to use it as a, as a marker on the otolus, the ear bones, or the, the vertebrae if in the case of sharks. Uh, it's basically, in, the, uh, the oxytetracycline gets incorporated into the hard structures of, of the fish and forms a, a little fluorescent ring if you look at it under ultraviolet light. So it's a way of, of validating aging in, in both fish and sharks. Um, and so we would use those tags for a specific um, tagging project, but we would indicate that to our taggers. If they caught a fish with a, an orange OTC tag in it, uh, we would want them to keep that fish so that we could get hold of the, the oatless or the vertebrae. Thanks, Gareth. And then I think, yeah, for the for the anglers in the audience this evening, I think the some of the biggest improvements that we've seen develop over the years with the with the tagging project is um, the techniques that that we've used um, both to catch the fish and to handle the fish. I think one of the biggest ones is actually the move away from using barbed J hooks, which is top left there, which is a typical hook that we would normally use to catch a fish. And more and more, we are now using circle hooks, which are the fish, the, the hooks on the right there where the point of the, the hook points towards the shank. Um, the reason for using a circle hook is because they very seldom get swallowed by the fish and you know sort of get hooked in the esophagus or the gills. And most of the time a circle hook will be caught in the scissors, in the side of the mouth, which is a much better place to, to catch and land the fish um, and also to remove the hook. Um, and that's been further improved by crimping the barb or filing off the barb and the hook um, so that it's much easier to, to remove it. Also by, by doing that, if the fish does swallow the hook, um, very, very often what we would do is rather than go in and try and use a pair of pliers to take that hook out, which causes much more damage. We just simply cut it off um, near the eye of the hook. And once you've released the, the pressure on that hook, it normally comes out on its own, um, particularly if it's a barbless hook. Then going to the middle set of diagrams, when we started in Eleanor's early days, that's her there with the, the yellow helmet on, you know, we were tagging fish, landing them in, in sort of rough nets and 
putting them onto the deck and they would flap around, lose a lot of scales, a lot of the mucus comes off. Um, they would be tagged and then chucked back. Um, and obviously you've got a lot of damage um, to the, the external surfaces doing that. So over time, we realized um, more and more that we need to handle the fish well. And in the middle, there's a picture of uh, Dr. Pat Garrett tagging a, a king mackerel. And here we're using um, a wet piece of foam or also a wet tile does quite well. So that's what we advocated to, to kind of lay the fish down on. And then we've had um, further improvements with these beautiful slings or measuring stretches that um, Colin Atwood and Paul Cowley really developed in their projects to handle the fish nicely. Um, and then on the right there, work done by Professor Warren Potts at Rhodes, um, fascinating work is showing that, you know, the really important thing with landing a fish is to keep them in water. Um, if you think, um, what's happening, think of yourself running 200 meter or sprinting 200 meters and then having somebody push your head under the water. That's effectively what we're doing to the fish because we catch them on the line, they're fighting for their life, um, getting really tired, fighting and stressed. And then we pull them out into the air and they can't breathe. So that's sort of the most important thing with handling fish. If you're going to release them and look up and ensure that they survive is to try and keep them in the water for as much of the time as possible. So what we advocate now, if you're fishing on the shore, for example, have a bucket of fresh seawater with you, put the fish straight into seawater, um, remove it, uh, measure it, tag it back into the bucket and then back into the sea. So what we advocate is no more than 30 seconds um, should that fish be out of, out, of the, out of the water. And then quickly at the bottom, another thing, um, particularly for the, the ski boat fishermen and, and Gary Thompson, who's in the audience tonight, has, has helped us in this regard, um, <clears throat> is the improvement of releasing fish with barotrauma. So barotrauma is that uh, picture in the left there. When you catch a fish at depth, if you're out at sea on a boat and you're fishing in 30 meters, you pull that fish up to the surface, the pressure greatly reduces as, it, as the fish comes up. And so the swim bladder that you find in most bony fish will expand and it'll force the stomach out of the mouth, as you can see in that, that diagram there. To return a fish will release a fish in that state is virtually impossible. That fish will just float on, on the surface unless sometimes they bite their, their stomach and release the air, but obviously that's not ideal. Um, so what we used um, in the early days was um, about a 12 gauge hypodermic needle, which we inserted through the body wall into the swim bladder. And it's literally like um, pricking a balloon. It goes and releases the air. And that fish is then able to swim down um, and through work that we've done in the aquarium, that swim bladder heals very quickly. So within a day or two, that fish is able to, again, get um, a neutrally buoyant um, situation underwater. I think the Australians developed the, the, the sort of weight downrigger system on the third bottom right there, which is simply a, a, a invo inverted hook with, with the barb crimped off and tied um, to a line. So simply when you release your fish, um, you tag it, measure it, and then hook that, um, that barbless hook onto the bottom lip and just let it down to the bottom where you caught it. Give a simple jerk um, of the line and you can retrieve your weight and the pressure um, recompresses the gas in the swim bladder and that fish can swim off normally and be completely neutrally buoyant as when um, you originally caught it. And a further improvement um, on this has been the sea equalizer, which is bottom right there, which is really a, a sort of, as we call it, a bogo grip that you clip onto the lip of the fish. Um, and you can preset that um, to release at a certain depth. I think they come with, with two or three settings, uh, depending at the depth that you're fishing at. And you, you clip your fish by, by the lip, um, let that weight take it down, and then as it gets to the depth, it automatically pops open and the, and the fish can swim off. So we really have improved um, the way of, of kind of releasing our fish and ensuring their, their survival. Thanks, Gareth. And then I think um, over to, when we started the project, a lot of our, our taggers were tagging all sorts of weird and wonderful fish, um, which were not really helping us learn a lot about them because um, 
yeah, you know, they lost their tags and not many of them were tagged. So it, it wasn't contributing to, to the science that we were trying to get out of it. So what we did was focus our anglers attention on some of the more important landfish species. So like you've got at the bottom there, um, the Garrick or Leophis, the Dusky Cob, uh, Khalyun, species like that where we've tagged many, many thousands of them, but have um, at the same time got really, really useful and important information from, from the tagging procedure. Thanks, Gareth. So yeah, um, that's that's a little bit of story about the, the, the tagging project. And I'm gonna hand over to Gareth now, who's gonna share with you um, some of the amazing um, results that we've had over the last 38 years. So over to you, GJ. Like a BQ, thank you so much. Um, yeah, guys, as we've heard, there's been a lot of history behind the ORI tagging project which obviously uh, relates down to some of the incredible achievements and results that we've um, gathered over the years, um, yeah, which I'm going to speak to you guys about now. So first of all, looking at the um, total number of members that have joined the project um, over the 38 year duration, um, we've had more than 7,000 people join, um, as you can see with this um, increasing gray line here, um, with an average of about 483 active uh, members, which are anglers that have tagged, tagged at least one fish per year, um, which you can see with this orange line, over here, um, and an average of about 183 new members who join each year, uh, which you can see with this blue line, um, which is quite great for us to see is how since 2016, um, the number of new members joining the project has incre increased quite rapidly, uh, mainly due to our um, greater presence on social media, um, and obviously leading to more anglers becoming more aware of the tagging project and wanting to contribute more towards um, conservation. Uh, looking at the total tag releases, um, Obviously, with increasing popularity and more anglers joining the tagging project, uh, this would obviously lead to a steady increase in the total number of fish tagged throughout the years, uh, which you can see with this orange line here, um, as well as the um, average number of fish tagged per angler, uh, which you can see with this blue line. Um, so, so far uh, throughout the tagging project, we've had over um, 374,000 fish tagged with an average of about 9,600 um, fish tagged per year. Um, and what, what was really great for us to see was um, back in 2021, um, we had a record number of fish tagged in a year with about 13,200 um, individuals tagged. Uh, onto the tag recaptures. So although the number of tag uh, releases is impressive, um, the tag recaptures are the most important um, aspect of the tagging project as uh, the recapture data is what allows us to look at things like the growth rates and movement patterns, for examples of various species. Um, this is also what we try to get across to our tagging members. So um, what to try to re reiterate to them is that it's not about the number of fish that they're tagging, but rather the quality um, of the fish handling um, and the tag that they're placing in the fish to ensure the best chances of survival and um, ultimately a recapture of that fish. So yeah, over the years, uh, there's been over 23,600 tag recaptures, so about 6.3% of the total tag releases, um, which can see us increase steadily with this orange line and um, with an average of about 600, 605 tag recaptures per year. Um, what is positive in this regard is um, how the recapture percentage has co um, continued to increase over the years, which you can see, um, sorry, from this blue line, um, suggesting that besides more fish being tagged, um, obviously allowing for more recaptures, the anglers are catching, handling, um, landing and tagging the catch in a more responsible manner. Um, which is something that we worked on um, throughout the tagging project, which Bruce uh, mentioned earlier. I'm um, looking at the top uh, tag regions for the tagging project. So as you can see, anglers have um, tagged fish all along the Southern African coastline. Um, however, in the late 1990s, the Namibian authorities requested that the Ori tagging members stop tagging fish in Namibian waters um, as they started their own tagging project there. So um, yeah, the 14,000 fish tag in Namibia was basically from, I think, 1984 to about 1998. Uh, moving on to the Western Cape. Um, yeah, the Western Cape has the most tag releases um, and recaptures uh, for the um, entire South African coastline. Uh, this is mainly because of the De Hoop tagging project, followed by um, the Eastern Cape with 100, oh, just over 100,000 tag releases. Um, this is mainly due to tagging projects um, such as the discontinued Tsukama um, MPA tagging project, the Pondland tagging project. Um, the tagging project that's run in Kuka Harbour, um, as well as the Dwesa River tagging projects. Uh, and then, yeah, moving on to KZN that has um, slightly less, um, about 87,000 tag releases overall, 
Um, and then uh, moving on to Mozambique, which has just over 7,000 tag releases. So um, what's great about the Mozambique region is that over the years, um, there's been many uh, fishing charter companies that have started targeting um, bigger game fish species, such as kingfish, um, queenfish, uh, king mackerel, and barracuda. So looking at uh, the top tag species for the project. So overall, there's been about 375 different species tagged um, to date for the project with an average of about um, 166 spe uh, species tagged per year. So from this uh, slide, we can see the total number of tag releases in white um, under the species name um, with the recapture in orange. Um, and now the percentage next to the recapture, that's not a um, recapture rate, but that's the recapture percentage um, that that species contributed to for the entire um, recaptures for the project. So the Chalyun, uh, for those of you who don't know, is actually South Africa's national fish species. And this species has the most number of tag releases with over 72,000 being tagged during the entire duration of the project, uh, making up about 19% of the overall tag releases um, with more than 5,300 tag recaptures. Um, most of these individuals were tagged um, in the Dehoeb tagging project by Colin Atwood and Lisa Swart, um, as well as Simon Walker um, in the Cape Point Nature Reserve. Um, other popular species that constantly make it onto our top 10 tag species list um, each year are species like the Dusky Cobb, um, Garrick, Spotted Grunter, um, all very popular um, species targeted by recreational anglers around our coast. Um, out of the elasmobranks, um, species such as the Dusky Shark, uh, Bronzuela shark, spotted gully sharks are also popular tag species that uh, make it onto this list. Um, and interestingly, you'll see there at the bottom right, um, blacktail, uh, although this species was removed off our priority species list a few years ago, um, basically because um, even though there were so many tagged, we were getting such little recaptures, mainly uh, due to the species shedding their tags and us um, getting very few recaptures. Um, but what's interesting is that even though they aren't tagged much nowadays. They still have made it onto um, this top tag priority species, uh, top, sorry, top, top tag list um, throughout the years. Looking at the top uh, tag recapture rate. So a recapture rate uh, basically refers to how many times a species has been uh, recaptured once it has been tagged. Um, so the T Natal sea catfish on the top left there um, is a popular species that um, has been caught in the Pondland Marine Protected Area in the Eastern Cape. Um, and um, through research um, from the amount of recaptures we've got, we've seen that this is a, a highly resident species. I mean, in the early years of the Pondland uh, Marine Protected Area Tagging Project, there were actually so many individuals of the species caught that we actually decided to stop tagging them. But to this day, we're actually still getting um, recaptures every um, trip that we go on. Another species with a high recapture rate is a speckled snapper, um, which is a prized and popular target species for recreational anglers. Um, and there's one that is often caught in the Ismangalisa MPA area. Uh, many of these individuals are actually tagged and recaptured by um, Bruce and his team during their quarterly uh, tagging trips to the um, Ismangalisa MPA during the fish monitoring and tagging project um, in this region. Uh, Scotsman, another popular species, um, mainly caught offshore, um, was, yeah, the species is mainly caught um, also during the Pondland MPA tagging project. And from these rec recaptures, we've also seen some um, incredible movements um, of the species moving north, uh, more than 1,200 kilometers. Uh, we had one individual that was tagged in Ponderland and recaptured all the way up in Mozambique. Um, onto the dark, dark shy shark. So this is a, another popular species caught uh, recreationally by anglers in the Hansby and Hermanus areas of the Western Cape. Um, they're also a popular species caught by scientific institutes in these regions, um, such as the South African Shark Conservancy and the Shark and Marine Research Institutes, um, who have both contributed uh, largely to the total number of tag releases um, and recaptures for this species. Um, from this data, we've also found that this is a highly resident um, species of shark. Um, onto the catfish rock cod, um, the species is found throughout South Africa and into Mozambique. Um, with the majority of these individuals being tabbed and recaptured from the shore, um, as well as on offshore reefs between Port Elizabeth and Cape Bartle and KZN. Um, and I'll touch a bit on the work we've done on catfish rock cod a bit later in the talk. Um, looking at the river snapper at the bottom right there, so this is another highly resident species, um, mainly caught in estuary, estuarine systems from KZN to Port Elizabeth. Um, and what is really interesting about this species is that often anglers um, or fish in a specific estuary um, year after year, and what happens is that they will tag a fish one year and then they'll come back a um, year later or a couple of years later and they'll catch that exact same fish that they tagged in the exact same region, which is um, 
yeah, quite cool to hear those recapture stories. So obviously with the tagging project being over 38 years old, um, we've had some really, truly remarkable tag recaptures over the years. So I'm just gonna touch on a few of these now. Um, this Regatooth talk, uh, sorry, Regatooth shark at the top here um, was originally tagged by Jeremy Cliff and the guys at um, KZN Sharks Board at 11 points in KZN on the 9th of December, 1993. Um, and it was recaptured on the 13th of March, 2020 in Frankman Hook in the Western Cape. I'm having spent more than 26 years at liberty with the same tag in place, which is absolutely incredible. And again, this goes to show um, how good the quality of tags are that whole print um, provide us with. Um, next one is a red stem breast that was originally tagged on the 2nd of September 1996 by Warren Potts and his team in uh, Middlebank in the Western Cape. And this individual was recaptured on the 6th of January 2022 at the Kai River Mouth um, in the Eastern Cape by Patrick Flanagan more than 25 years later. So what is really special about this um, tag recapture is that it's our longest time at liberty for Tilias um, or bony fish in the project. Um, this next recapture, sorry, um, is a prime example of just how um, important tag and release projects are. So uh, Roman were originally thought to only live to about 19 years based on previous outlet research. Um, however, um, this uh, special individual proved different when it was recaptured more than 22 years later and released again to fight another day, showing that they um, are capable of living even longer than what we originally thought. So what you can also see from this recapture is that it only grew 20 centimeters in the 22 years it was at liberty, indicating that this species has an extremely slow growth rate. Um, Sherman also showed us um, just how important no-take uh, marine protected areas are around the Southern African coastline. Um, and how they contribute towards conservation of many of our lionfish species. Um, because this individual was um, tagged by a team of scientists in Lakavat in the Rehoep uh, Marine Protected Area. And it was recaptured 22 years later in the exact same spot by the same group of scientists, um, showing just how resident the species is. When we look at um, individuals that have moved really um, far distances, um, so what is really encouraging for this project is that um, when we get recaptures from uh, countries outside of South Africa. So what you can see uh, from this yellowfin tuna, um, it was originally tagged um, at Cape Point in the Western Cape. And in true tuna migratory fashion, it moved more than 5,600 kilometers and was recaptured by a commercial fisherman in Seychelles who encouragingly reported the recapture back to us. Um, another incredible movement was made uh, by another well-known migratory species, the black marlin. So this individual was originally tagged in Sedwana Bay in KZN um, and recaptured in southern Tanzania, having moved uh, over 3,600 kilometers at quite an impressive 15.1 uh, kilometers per day. So, um, yeah, Bruce has talked about the history of the project um, and given you a really great overview. And I've talked to you about um, the various results and achievements of the project. So, how has all of this um, helped contribute towards conservation? So, as you could see from the results, um, from the project that there's been some incredible data collected over the years. And this data has been used in many research projects, um, scientific publications, a uh, number of postgraduate with um, degrees, um, to name a few. And some recent scientific publi uh, publications have actually, <coughs> sorry, um, I'll share. So yeah, some recent scientific publications have actually looked at the movement patterns and growth rates of various lionfish species um, such as the critically endangered white spotted wedgefish, the cave bass, and the Scotsman, um, you know, over the recent years. And in addition to these scientific publications, um, there have been some numerous popul popular um, articles, newspaper reports, um, radio broadcasts, and television documentaries that have also highlighted um, various aspects of the tagging project, um, as well as the Sombra YouTube channel, where, as Bruce mentioned, our um, instructional tagging videos can be viewed. So. Furthermore, um, the Ori Tagging Project also has um, a really cool Facebook page and Instagram page, which has been a really uh, useful platform to help us share interesting recaptures and other tagging related posts with anglers and members of the public, um, which to date have reached hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so obviously with the Tagging Project being a citizen science project, it is vital for the project's achievements um, that are uh, to be highlighted and shared with tagging members, uh, which is exactly what the Tagging Project has done over the years. Um, so where is the tagging project going um, as well, um, or where has it come from um, over these 38 years? So 
there's been vast improvements in angler attitudes towards fishing and um, obviously improving it, uh, promoting conservation. And uh, the concept of tag and release has partly been responsible for changing the ethics of recreational, uh, the recreational fishing community, uh, many of, of whom now um, actually release the catch, which obviously helps to ensure more sustainable fishing. Um, and a paper recently published by Mann, um, or Judy Mann et al, um, in 2022 looked um, at just that. So um, basically what happened is that we sent through a survey, I mean, interviewed uh, various tagging members um, with questions about the tagging project. And what we found was that the tagging project has actually made a considerable contribution towards improving the conservation ethics um, and behavior of marine recre recreational anglers in South Africa. Um, which was great about this paper is that it also actually helped us to um, identify that improved communication with anglers, both taggers and non-taggers, and through the tagging project has the potential to amplify much needed conservation information to the broader angling community, um, thereby enhancing environmental awareness. Um, furthermore, um, obviously there are some limitations uh, to fish tagging using um, external DART tags. So basically we aren't able to identify what an individual is doing um, or where, how it moves in between the tag release and recapture. Um, however, with improved technology, um, acoustic telemetry has helped us to um, identify and monitor uh, fine scale movement patterns and behaviors of various lionfish species. So how this works is, um, you can see the top right hand corner there, and um, this is an acoustic tag, which is about the size of a battery that is placed into the dorse, uh, so the stomach cavity of, a, of an animal um, or externally. And um, what these tags do is that they send a ping, um, or emit a ping to um, something called a receiver, which you can see are placed all around um, the South African coastline um, in this map here. And what will actually be um, a really great follow-up talk for um, the tagging project would be um, a talk um, by the ATAP guys uh, from SIAB on just the work that just the work that they've done with the acoustic telemetry. So yeah, just to get back to how we've used um, the dot tags and the acoustic telemetry to fill the gaps of various movements um, is a, a paper that we um, published on the movements of the catfish rock cod. So by using both these methods, um, it basically showed us that this species is likely to be a temporary resident on shallow inshore reefs, um, that they showed higher site fidelity um, and occupied relatively small home ranges for periods, um, seldomly exceeding about a year, uh, where after they would appear to undertake um, ranging movement types. Um, what this data also allowed us to see is that uh, the current species-specific lionfish regulations and the recently expanded marine protected area network along the east coast of, of South Africa um, are believed to be adequate to ensure um, future uh, sustainable use of the species. Um, yeah, so that was really um, some great work that we um, could do on the catfish rock cod. And furthermore, um, we're also looking at using this telemetry um, stuff to look at more fine scale movement patterns and also fill in um, the gaps for other species such as the um, white spotted wedge fish and the copper shark and the diamond ray. So yeah, we hope that you guys um, enjoyed our talk um, on the tagging project um, and that you got to see just how important tag and release projects like this are. Um, if you guys haven't done so already, uh, please give us a like and a follow on our Facebook and Instagram page. I mean, you can also find all our um, tagging videos on our Sombra YouTube um, channel. And if you have any other information, please feel free to uh, visit our website. Um, also, I hope that uh, yeah, many of you um, anglers out there have purchased and downloaded the Ori Fish app, which uh, Bruce is going to quickly tell you a bit more about. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. Um, <clears throat> this is a this is a little app that we developed uh, at the start of. Uh, it was released in in twenty twenty. Um, it covers um, sure two hundred and forty nine um, lionfish species. Uh, in quite a lot of detail. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's really got useful information such as uh, a length uh, a length weight relationship. You can simply enter the, the length of the fish that you catch and at a, a touch of a button, it'll give you the weight. Um, it has the regulations of, of all these lionfish species. Um, and then it's got information on their biology, their distribution. Um, there's a nice little key that you could identify the fish you've caught if you don't know what it is, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of information on this. It's like having a little um, Rudy Funder Else Common Sea Fishers book in your pocket on your phone, 
Um, it's available, it only costs 200 Rand, um, and it's available from Google Play and, and App Store, depending what um, cell phone you've got. Um, just simply go and search for the Marine Fish Guide for Southern Africa, and you'll find it. And look, it's something that I think that every angler who's interested in fish um, would want to have this, because you can take it with you sort of keep your cell phone in your tackle box. And if you need to find out information, it's right there at, at a touch. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a tool that um, all of the, the anglers along the South African coast could, could really use. So yeah, a little bit of a marketing exercise there, but yeah, thanks. Cool, yeah, thanks guys for listening. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to fire away. Gareth and Bruce, we just want to thank you. Um, I think I speak on behalf of the whole community if I say that we are in awe of this um, project that outlived the analog telephone and the South African post office um, and the Nokia phone. Um, it's, you know, uh, I'm sure I see you already have an app. It's, I'm excited to anticipate how you will be using um, artificial intelligence in the tu in the, in the future so um, looking forward to see where this project will go in the future um, congratulations on the enormous contribution that you made to um, science and conservation but also on the huge amount of fishermen that you converted to conservation I mean, you gave us a window into um, into the ocean, but also into human behavior and those those fish, those tag and release and, and recapture uh, statistics are just absolutely amazing. And, you know, uh, uh, this really shows the value of uh, citizen science. So thank you for this. Thank you for your um, presentation tonight, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks guys. It was a really, really interesting um, talk. I uh, learned a lot, not being a fisherman myself, but I'm a, um, a bird ringer as well. So there's a lot of uh, commonalities as, as Bruce uh, did mention. Bruce um, and uh, Gareth, maybe you guys just want to unmute yourselves again because you would have been muted and uh, I think maybe Judy as well if you want to. Um, so I see Peter Turner's got his hand up uh, very quickly. I guess he's got a question. So let's go straight to Peter. I'm going to ask him to unmute. Oh, thanks, uh, Bruce and Gareth, for a really, really great talk. Um, you know, being a fisherman from Carmel Ski Boat Club, certainly uh, we support this initiative very strongly. Um, my, my question is, uh, do we believe that we've actually optimized um, the population of data that you have? Or would you want more? And if you wanted more, what would that optimized number be? I know that you're doing great work in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, the online tagging stuff in, at sea, that's the future. But would you like a bigger database uh, with what you have now? And what would that look like? Um, Peter, from my side, um, the ultimate for me would be, even though we're obviously going to get more and more tag releases coming in, for me, I would like to get a bigger database of the tag recaptures. I mean, I think that's a lot. Um, a big thing that we've been working on over the recent years with um, trying to improve, obviously, handling of fish and, and the tagging techniques and all this stuff so that we can ultimately contribute um, or ultimately allow the fish that have been tagged to survive to be recaptured. And so for me, even though um, tag releases are going to constantly improve, for me, I, want, um, I would really like to see as a tagging officer uh, more and more recaptures coming through um, so we can get, um, obviously, that movement and growth information. Yeah, thank you. Bruce, I, think, I don't know if you have anything more to add. Yeah, yeah. Peter, from, from my side, I think it's 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 quite a tricky, it's quite a tricky thing to know sort of when is when is enough? When have we tagged um enough Khalyun, for example? We've we've tagged, you know, sort of so many thousand and we've got over five thousand recaptures. We've learned a lot about Khalyun, um, but you know, it's still as that database grows, we are learning more and more and getting better and better information so you know we wouldn't necessarily want to stop um the tagging of Kalyun, for example because we think we've got enough but i think what what um gareth spoke about at the end is 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 really exciting going forward is that we we're getting better um 
methods of, of understanding and, and tracking fish movements using acoustic tags um, and satellite tags, things like that. And I think that is really going to kind of um, answer lots of the riddles that we, we can't really understand um, using, using the conventional dart tagging. But um, from the point of view of a citizen science project and involving anglers and members of the public, um, this, this, this method, although it's, it's quite an old tried and tested method, um, is, has been wonderful, as, as you are aware, of, of, of involving fishermen in the project. So, you know, we, we have to think quite carefully about sort of the, what's, what's, what's enough and what's the best sort of number to go yeah. for. Thank you. Maybe if I can ask a question just a little bit linked to that. Um, surely, if you were to stop, that's going to tell you what you had done historically, and then into the future, you won't know the impact. So in my mind, uh, is it not the right thing to keep on going forever? Because, you know, as fish die, you need to retag new ones. Yes, so Martin, hundred percent. I think I think that's 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 basically on it. Um, unfortunately, these things cost money, um, and yeah. and that's going to be our challenge sort of going forward. Um, fortunately, we're in a very good position um, with our funding at the moment, but um, you never know. And yeah, it, it costs a lot of money to to import these tags from from Australia, so that it's an expensive project to run, um, and that might be a challenge going forward. Great, thanks for the answer. Um, Viv, I'll come to you in two seconds. Uh, there's quite a few questions in the chat, so I just want to uh, read those out. And again, if anyone has put a question in the chat and you're feeling brave enough to read it, I see uh, Pete uh, van der Vest has an ISTL on. So I don't know, Pete, if you wanting to uh, verbalize your question or if you want me to uh, read it, maybe just um, put up your hand, uh, I'm happy. Otherwise, I'll read it for you. It says, um, I've been from... Richards Bay since 1987. I used to be an active tagger when our coast was still open to beach diving. Since the beaches were closed and I had to use excise points to the fishing spot, I became one of the victims to mugging at gunpoint. My question, can there be a special permit for beach diving, driving for taggers? Oh, hi, I, I've got the guts. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, um, uh, yeah, I'm one of the victims. I'm sure there's quite a lot, especially um, the further north you go. Bruce, I met through Kevin Green, which used to be the officer uh, through um, uh, the parks boat, the old parks boat. He was on the marine side. And uh, Bruce, quite often, once a year, we had a tagging session in the harbor. And also along our beaches, but since the beaches are closed, and yeah, uh, we concentrated in town and certain spots, and that's where my tagging career uh, basically came to a stop. So basically, you've read the question. Uh, yeah, I'm still passionate about it. Uh, so yeah, thanks for your great work. Thanks, uh, Peter. Thank I didn't see that you come on. Uh, yeah, uh, Bruce or Gareth, feel free, please, yeah. to answer. I'll, I'll give it a go. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, look, um, it's a it's a difficult one, and um, if we go to the the beach driving ban, um, there have been some some sort of negative um, impacts as as has happened in the Richards Bay area, but by far, I think the the impacts have been incredibly positive. Um, there are many, many, many anglers who've spoken to me about um, how the fish stocks have improved since that ban, because effectively what we did is we made large parts of our coast inaccessible um, to fishermen, because previously they could only get there by driving along the beach. Those areas when driving was stopped, um, the, fish, the fish have improved, and, and we've seen this up at Cape Bidal, for example. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overall, um, to answer the question, one, I think that the beach vehicle ban has been positive for our fish stocks. It obviously there are problems in these these areas where where you become um, vulnerable because you're on foot and not in a vehicle. Um, we get asked often as the tagging project can you know because we tagging members can we go and fish in 
uh, an area that's close to fishing or can we use our vehicle to go tagging it's it's very difficult to kind of give permission to to do that that sort of thing unless it's in a in a, a kind of really closely controlled project sort of format so what i would suggest pete is that you you kind of um, get involved there, there, there are quite a few projects um, along the coast where scientists are using teams of anglers to go and um, tag fish um, in certain areas um, and to to join those those groups because then you get get to at some stages either drive or, or use a boat and, and go into these um, marine protected areas um, where other people don't get the opportunity to fish and you experience firsthand what it's what it's like um, where, where fish fish numbers are like they should be and, and not like what they are in the exposed areas. But yeah, sorry, so a bit of a roundabout answer to your question. Thanks, uh, Bruce. I'm going to go across to Viv now. She's had her hand up for quite a while. Well, it might be a guy, I'm not sure. Um, I, I see you did also put a, a question in the um, in the in the chat. And uh, Viv, uh, do you want to ask that question or is it another question? <laughs> Oh, no, it is the same question. I just want to ask, sure. um, mostly, if you're a very active angler with tagging, we often get asked on social media in particular about why tag, and we get these long stories of, you know, if you tag fish, you're hurting fish, and I've seen so many bad tags, and what's the point of releasing fish if they're just going to wash up dead? And you give them this answer, and although you feel like it's a good answer, you kind of feel like you're not doing the answer justice. So I just want to ask Bruce Mann personally, what would be his ideal version of an answer so that we can convey that to the community? Because often the people who aren't involved in the tagging project or who are involved with the recapture reports don't fully see the project for what it is because they're not an active tagging member. So yeah, I just want to improve my answers. <laughs> Hi, Viv. Yeah, thanks, 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 thanks for the question. You're putting me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think I think the important the important thing is um, is as a tagger and as a, a member of the tagging project, you you are um, able able to kind of be almost an ambassador and a, a conservationist on the beach. You can talk talk to these other anglers and, and explain to them what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, that's very important. Um, and I think in terms of some of the perceptions about um, damage damage to fish, certainly mm -hmm. um, there have been numbers of recaptures where um, there's lots of biofouling on the tag or there's a big wound mm -hmm. around the tag. Um, and that's horrible to look at and it, it upsets people. Um, a number of our taggers um, have stopped tagging because they feel that they, they're hurting the fish um, rather than doing a good job. Um, to address that, we've really tried to focus um, as much um, effort as we can on the handling of fish and doing it mm -hmm. properly. Um, putting the tag in the right place in the right way, um, cleaning your equipment, etc. And if it's done well, um, you know, there's there's very limited or very little damage to the fish and they survive and, and grow really well. So that's, it's a long answer, but that's the type of information I think we need to to convey to the to the anglers sort of out there mm. who are watching you and and can be very critical of, of what you're doing. No, definitely. I hope, hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, it's just the thing is that, I mean, we can understand it from a scientific perspective, but now you're explaining to someone who knows nothing yeah. behind the science. So it's just, yeah. it's trying to translate that, that can be the difficult part. Sure, sure. Hmm. Thanks for yeah, a great talk. Sure if you want to add uh, to that at all, or? Um, yeah, for, thanks for the question. Um, I've also had a lot of anglers phone me and stuff as well, complaining about horrible scars and stuff they've seen on the fish. And like Bruce said, the best thing to do as a tagging member is to be an ambassador and yeah, just try explain the good that comes from the tagging as much as possible. So like how we've been able to study various important line fish species, how we've um, been able to use the data, obviously, to look at regulations and all that stuff to help protect species, obviously, for future populations. Um, but yeah, it's it's a super tough one because obviously they're going to be guys for tagging and guys against tagging, um, whether they're anglers or not as well. I mean, yeah. No, no, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I just, Thanks for I a great some talk. Information, I think some of the information that was shared, I mean, there's fish living 22 years and it kind of speaks for itself. It's it's actually amazing. 100%. And I, don't think, I don't think a lot of anglers would have actually known that, that fact at all if it wasn't for what you guys are doing. Um, just a question, the Gareth and team, awesome info. Can you discuss the tagging of ray species? And that's from Noor Adam from Durban KZN. So Gareth, maybe if you want to go with that. And then... Cool. Um, I've actually prepared a slide for this. Let me just share my screen here. <laughs> okay, cool. So I thought this would come up. Um, cool. Can you guys... He's a boy scout in his part-time. <laughs> Be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just see. And then Andrew, keep your memory strong because you, you're up next. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I think you said uh, Noah Adam asked the question. Yeah, um, yeah. So, sorry, what is he asking again, Marty? Why have we stopped? Yeah, can the you discuss of the tagging? Or? Yeah, can you just discuss the tagging of, of ray species? I think it's a bit of a general question. I'm not too sure if he's involved with it, but maybe yeah, tell us something um, about that thing. Yeah, so just a little bit of background. Um, so it's been something that Bruce and I have been discussing. Um, even Stuart Dunlop, when he was previous tagging officer, he also discussed with Bruce about um, the tagging, the tag placement um, in various ray species, because um, those of you who aren't too aware of the ray anatomy, I'm um, just above, if you can see on the screen here, um, where this tag is that's bleeding, just above there is basically the um, kidneys of the tag, uh, kidneys of the tag, kidneys of the ray, and often, <laughs> Because rays are quite hard species to handle um, and tag, guys would often tag rays in the kidneys, for example, um, which yeah, obviously isn't good for the species. And also what we've seen over the years is that we've only got about a 1% recapture rate from all the rays we've tagged over the years. I mean, we've tagged thousands and thousands of rays. Um, to only get a 1% tag recapture rate, it's not really providing us with that much information. Um, yeah, so we basically um, made the decision to prohibit the tagging of rays um, a couple of months ago just to yeah, try keep the species best interest um, at heart yeah, and stuff. Um, I don't know if Bruce wants to add a bit more to the tagging of rays. He's been doing it a lot longer than I have. I mean, has a lot more experience. Yeah. No, thanks, Gareth. I think you've I think you've covered the, the main points. I mean, they they are difficult animals um, to tag, um, stingrays in particular, um, you need to be very careful how you handle them. Um, it's difficult to insert the, the, the tag because of the, of the tough skin. Um, so where we, we have been wanting to tag rays and we've done this in, in captive in the aquarium to find out the best place to do it is basically um, in, the, in the muscle at the base of the tail. Um, but it's it's quite hard skin there, so you need to again use a little um, spike to to pierce the skin first, and then insert the the tag almost parallel to the vertebral column into the musculature. There. So it's it's a it's it's a it requires a, a kind of knowledge um, of the anatomy, and and it's quite difficult to do. And we found you know from a lot of the the pictures that we've been sent um, by our anglers that they they're not getting it right. Um, they're tending to tag more to the side, which is going into the internal organs, as Gareth said. Um, and a lot of those animals will, will, will die as a, as a consequence of being badly tagged. So we, we've taken a decision that although, you know, we, we obviously like to get more information on their movements, that in the interests of, of good conservation ethic, um, that, that we don't want our, our general taggers to tag raise. Um, however, there are several tagging projects, have, as we've mentioned, that are, are run by, by scientists in some of our MPAs, um, and there we can continue to tag them because it's done um, with understanding of exactly how to do it. So that's the reason we've, we've taken the race off our priority list um, as species that we want our taggers to tag. Thanks, Bruce and Gareth, for that. Um, Andrew, I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Thanks very much, uh, Marty, and uh, the presenters. It's very interesting indeed. Now, uh, if you look at the presentation and the statistics that were presented, um, there's so much information that has been gathered uh, through recaptured uh, tagged fish. 
Now, my question is, has uh, some of the information been uh, you know, shared with the communities? Because it may happen that the people recapture tech fish and they, it's not their you know, bread and butter, and then they throw it back into the sea or uh, whatever. So it might cause some harm into the other species in the ocean or the sea. So I just wanna know if uh, that type of information is, uh, is shared. I know, for instance, here in Gambia, uh, people just go you know, angling and uh, catching fish. They eat everything. So I thought the information collected thus far on tagging might assist the communities in terms of, you know, is this the type of fish that I can, you know, if I have uh, caught it, uh, can I eat it or, or what, you know, instead of throwing it back into the sea because it's not what you want. Thanks, Andrew. Yep, I'll, Thanks. I'll have a go at, at answering your question, Andrew. Nice question, thank you. Yes, um, in terms of communication and making people aware um, about the tagging project, we, we've certainly tried to advertise it as widely as we can through all sorts of media, um, particularly fishing tackle shops and that. So because it's been going for 38 years now, um, the mm -hmm. tagging project in South Africa is, is quite well known. Um, but in some of the more rural areas um, where we have a lot of... Um, subsistence or small scale fishermen, um, they're not sort of getting that information. So in a lot of the, the work I've done up in this Mangaliso area, for example, I've given, done training courses with, with um, community fishermen. And, and I've always made a point of explaining um, the tagging project to, to these people. And one of the things that I stress is that if you, if you catch a fish with a tag in it, um, you're allowed to keep that fish. Um, if you're a fisherman and you're hungry and you want that fish for supper, by all means, if that fish is legal, if it's in size and, and you, you're within your bag limit, you can take that fish home, but please send us the information from the tag so that we can, can learn from it. Um, a lot of people, even now along the coast, they, they'll catch a tagged fish and they think it, it belongs to somebody else. Um, so they put it back and say, oh, no, it's, it's, you know, it's somebody else's fish and never report it. So we've done surveys um, along the coastline interviewing fishermen randomly. And our, our stats suggest that about 40% of, of fishermen, um, if they catch a tagged fish, won't report it to us. They, they, they either don't know where or don't know what the tag is. So I'm, I'm hoping that you know, um, presentations like this um, with, with sort of people listening here, we can spread the word uh, a little bit wider about the project and, and about the importance of, of reporting those, those tag fish to us. So, Andrew, I hope I've, I've answered your question. And uh, yeah, 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 no, great. But now again, is uh, maybe this type of information can be customized to the language of the less educated people, you know, uh, that will help a heck of a lot, I think. Sure, sure. No, I agree. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, um, thanks very much. There's a question in the chat that's quite closely linked, and it's not really a question. Um, it's from Sibyl Rietmiller. Um, she was just saying, great information. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. We had a PhD researcher uh, tagging fish in our Chumbe MPA in the 1990s to prove the spillover effect. But getting um, them returned from the artisanal fishers, uh, fishers was a, a big challenge. So again, I think possibly maybe some more education, maybe some documentation, as you said, and even um, what is the ideal thing for the fisherman who does catch it that doesn't mind throwing it back? Um, what, what do you want him to record? A photograph of it or a because he's not going to weigh it per se, um, yeah, or he might, yeah. but yeah. What, what sort of things that you'd ideally want them to, to return to you, if not the yeah. fish? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of thought and, and emphasis has gone into this, this very aspect. And, and one of the, the quick fix solutions is to offer a reward for, for the tag information. So if somebody catches a tag fish, um, if they supply that information that they get, you know, a hundred bucks or, or something like that. 
but we've tried that. And in fact, in that, that first project I spoke about, the Dusky Shark project in the early, early 60s, uh, we offered a reward in those days, it was five rand for the re return of a tag information. Uh, that was a lot of money in those days. Um, and it was completely abused. Um, people yeah, were, <laughs> were taking tags wherever they could find them and bringing them in with no information, just saying, I, I got this tag, please can I have my five bucks kind of thing. So mm. reward systems also skew the, the reason for, for the project. You know, Then it becomes about the money and not about the science. So what we've tried to do is, is highlight that the reward for the tagging information, if you catch a, a, a fish with a tag and you send it to us, we will supply you, the, the fisherman who's caught it, with all the information about that fish, where it was originally tagged, who tagged it, how much it's grown, how far it swum, all that information get, gets sent to you. Um, and I think that's that's kind of, it's worked it's worked well, but it, it it's difficult, obviously, in, in the artisanal, fishery situation that Sylvia is referring to where um, you, you, you want the, those fishermen to kind of re return that information to you. But that's the way we've, we've tried to focus our, our project on. Right. And just to add to that, Marty, so um, just with regards to the type of data that we do want from these anglers, um, obviously, number one would be that tag number because often um, guys will phone me, tell me, no, they um, took a picture of the tag, but they just took a picture of the number, of the cell phone number. They didn't actually get a number of the picture of the actual tag number. And for us, I mean, obviously we can't we can't use that. So yeah, it's just basically getting information out there to guys that we really just need that tag number and where the fish was caught. Um, mainly, I mean, obviously some of the guys don't have measuring tapes or scales or everything with them. But yeah, those are like the, the main types of data that we want the anglers to collect um, if they are going to report a recapture to us. And, and, and I mean, and that's pretty you, simple for the artisanal guys and stuff as well. And, and then would you prefer then that they actually put it back in as the, 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 the best option as opposed to keeping it? Um, um, yeah, obviously that would, that would be number one price for us. But like as Bruce said, a lot of these guys are catching the fish because they're hungry and they need to eat. So um, what I tell the guys as well that it, it's the fish isn't our fish. Um, obviously, it's, if you want to keep it, you can. We just really just want that data so we can contribute or continually grow our um our database awesome thanks think, uh, thanks mark uh, i'm gonna ask if, you if to i ask can your just quickly if i can just yeah. add to that so um in some of our our um research projects where we where we've been tagging fish and recapturing them ourselves um we obviously release re-release those fish so we record the information and put them back um and we've had a couple of species and and two that come to mind one one was a yellow belly rock cod and the other one was one of those Natal sea catfish, where the same fish um, has been recaptured over nine times, um, you know, over a period of years. Um, so it's incredible that, you know, if you put it back, it keeps on doing the job that you, you're asking it to do by, <laughs> by tracking where it's going. Um, but clearly, as Gareth says, that, uh, you know, we, we can't um, insist that that happens. So, the, the data is is the primary information that we want. So if you're going to keep that fish, you're welcome to do so. But please send us the the tag number and the where you caught it and the date, and if if you can, the length of the fish. The spaghetti tag, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure you would welcome to actually meet the guys and have a chat and let them learn more yeah. engaging with you. I think that would yeah. actually encourage them. Yeah. It's appealing to their sort of higher actual. Uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, the highest actualization, I think it is. Um, Mike Bruton, if uh, uh, you can please unmute yourself and ask your question, and thanks for your patience. Oh, thanks, Marty. You know, when one is in the thick of these projects, you don't necessarily uh, realize just what a fantastic achievement it is. And I'd like to congratulate the RE team and all their collaborators on this world-class project uh, achieved over a long timeline. And, uh, you know, one thinks also of the turtle project that's been carried out in KwaZulu-Natal, and I think they are absolutely world-class projects. I can remember in the very early days of the tagging project, chatting to Rudy van der Els and, you know, him saying, you know, we're going to release the fish into the great big ocean. Will we ever catch it again? <laughs> you know, there was a serious doubt as to whether there'd be any recaptures. And it's fantastic. 
to see the recaptures and the just for interest um when i was based at lake sabaya from 1970 to 1976 we carried out a tagging program there on the Mozambique uh, tilapia and, and the sharp tooth catfish, and particularly on the sharp tooth catfish, it, it yielded extremely useful data. And even the, the whole program was just good share. Um, we really um, you know, got some wonderfully uh, good data out of it. But there was one strange movement that was recorded. Um, we tagged a fish in Lake Sabaya. And a few years later, I got a message from someone who would caught a fish in Lake Michigan with my tag in it. And we and he asked me, you know, how did this fish get from Lake Sabai to Lake Michigan? Well, it turned out a fish in Lake Michigan and had been recaught. Um, my question is, how does the scale of this tagging project carried out by Orient collaborators compare with similar projects elsewhere in the world? Thanks, Mark. Over to you, Gareth. You can handle that one. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so I only actually recently found out about um, a lot of other tagging projects around the world. and. Um, funny you mentioned that we're actually doing a um, online conference um, with a bunch of different tagging projects in August um, from Australia, from America, from New Zealand, um, where we're going to actually collaborate and have a look at um, the various tagging projects, what we've done, um, what each project does differently and stuff. And um, I think the Ori tagging project is definitely up there with one of the longest standing um, citizen science tagging projects in the world. Um, I know in Africa it's the longest, but um, in the world I think uh, there's a tagging project called SunTag um, from Australia that I think has been around about the same time. And I think they've got over a million um, different, uh, or 11,000 tag, I mean, 1 million tag fish, um, which is quite an achievement. They reached it um, the other day, but I think um, the variety of species that they tag is also a lot larger um, than us. But um, the tagging project's definitely up there with one of the greats um, compared to other tagging projects around the world. And um, it's going to be really interesting to actually collaborate with um, these other guys and just see exactly um, how we can improve our project, um, how our project can possibly improve their projects. Um, yeah, and just learn different techniques and stuff as well from how other um, yeah, projects are doing things around the world. Yeah, I think oh, Bruce, to, add, you to, add, to <laughs> add to that, yeah. Gareth, yeah, I think we, as far as, Mark, as far as the citizen science projects go, we um, anglers are actively involved we we probably in the top five um in the world now so yeah it's 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 it, as you say it's a world-class project and um certainly kudos to to rudy for his his brainchild and, and putting it together um really amazing amazing project thanks mark um there's an is that is that um done your questions Cool. I think that's done. Um, he's done. There's a question in the chat um, from Gregory Stubbs. I'll just read that uh, if Gregory is not uh, wanting to to ask it himself, but it is also linked to um, to the topic that we're talking about: international uh, tagging projects. It uh, I haven't seen him there. So anyway, I'll read it there. I'd like thoughts of interested people of reseeding critical endangered species using sustainable aquaculture techniques and with mindful input with regards to biodiversity, long established techniques in the USA, Japan, Australia, et cetera. I have a dream. Can we answer <laughs> his dream? <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's, it's, it's straying a little bit off the, off the subject of tagging, but um, yeah, certainly it has been um, for a long time um, a, a question in the minds of, of certainly many anglers is we, we, we witnessing um, the decline of, of many of our, our fish stocks through, through overfishing and, and sometimes um, other, other sources uh, of factors such as pollution, habitat destruction, et cetera. Um, and one of the, the solutions that jumps to mind is, is artificially reseeding. And as, as um, Craig, I think it is, um, has, has said, um, you know, it's being done in other parts of the world. Well, with very, very mixed success. Um, a lot of the projects um, in the early days uh, where they were, were reseeding large numbers of, 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 
of, of fish that were grown up in a hatchery um, actually never survived um, and didn't contribute to the, the wild stocks um, at all. There were also um, quite serious concerns about genetics of the of the fish stocks because you you you've got a small brood stock you hatchery rearing fish and then releasing them into the wild you may be um, upsetting the the gene pool in some respects there's also concerns about um, parasites that you may be adding into the wild stock or or disease um, and all of those factors need to be carefully taken into account um, having said that there are some programs around the world where they are having success. Um, I think of um, <clears throat> the Red Drum in the, the Gulf of Mexico, of Texas, um, striped bass. Um, and at the moment uh, in Australia, there's a project looking at reseeding of what they call mulloway, um, very similar species to our, our dusky cob. Um, and as far as I know to date, the, the dusky cob reseeding has, has not been successful. So, you know, they're tagging, um, genetically tagging these fish so they can, they can track um, whether they're being recaught in the fishery. Um, and the, the, the sort of reseeded, artificially reseeded animals are not surviving in the wild. So it's, it's a very tricky thing to do and, and potentially you could have a drastic impact on the biodiversity. So if it's something that you're going to do, you have to take very, very careful measures and, and make sure that you're doing it properly. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Chris, uh, you see your hand is up if you would like to unmute yourself. Bruce and Gareth, thanks so much for a very interesting discussion, really enjoying it. I'm making some big stroke assumptions here. My assumption is that there would, under normal circumstances where you do research, there would be a correlation between the number of taggers that you have in a specific area versus the amount of data that you receive. So if there's a drop in taggers, then there could also be a drop in the amount of data that you receive. But if the number of taggers remain the same in a given area, and then suddenly there's not data coming in, is there then an assumption that there's some other trend happening that you are not aware of what it is um, because data is not coming in where the taggers are there and you would expect a similar sort of trend over years. And is there something, try, do you then try to investigate why do you get this drop in numbers if the taggers stay the same amount of, of people? I hope you get my just. Uh, uh, Gareth or Bruce? Maybe the taggers are just getting lazy, Chris, and uh, <laughs> they're, not, yeah. they're not as busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chris, yeah, no, thanks no. for the question. Um, I'll have a crack at it. It's, it's very difficult for us to, to track that kind of thing because we have such a diversity of taggers. We have um, taggers who, you know, honestly will tag four or five fish in the year um, and that's it and they do that when they're on holiday and you know if they happen to catch um, a fish that they can tag whereas other taggers are absolutely avid you know that every time they go fishing and they fish um, five times a month kind of thing they'll be tagging fish so for us um, it's quite hard to to track that regionally to see but we, we certainly would see if you know at the end of the year when we analyze our data if there was a big gap um say coming from the western cape we, we would be able to pick that up and and we would um investigate what's going on um but we haven't had a, a situation like that to the best of best of my knowledge yeah thanks gareth cool um i'm just going to ask another question from the chat um from kentley sayers how or where is that information available, Bruce? The tagging project where you involve anglers in the in these special tagging projects in Cape Vital, for example. Okay. Um, what we do is is we have a an annual tagging newsletter that we produce um, every year, which which tries to to summarize the the, the up to date results of the tagging project. And also in that tagging newsletter, we, we, we kind of highlight some of the projects that are, are taking place around, around the, the country. So 
I would suggest the best would be to, to contact Gareth and, and to ask him directly if you're interested in getting involved and he can and then sort of relay you to the right people. Awesome, yeah. thanks. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, for Gimba if uh, they can please unmute. There, oh, go for it, very, ask your question. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Fajimba uh, from Gambia, West Africa. Uh, very interesting uh, program. Um, actually, my question is uh, whether uh, have you ever taken a fish which uh, travel away up to West Africa, Gambia? My question is, uh, do you uh, have any records uh, whether uh, uh, the fish you attack or satellite attack uh, travel to West Africa, to Gambia? So. Okay. okay. Thanks for joining yes, um, yeah, I don't think we've had one go up West Africa uh, for Jimba. Um, we have had quite a few, as a, you saw um, in my slides, they go up to Seychelles and Tanzania and stuff. But sure, um, as far up as West Africa, I'm not sure. I think the furthest we've had is maybe Angola. But um, yeah, I, I, we haven't yeah, seen any movements further than that. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe for Jimba, you need to tag a few fish there and see if we find them in South Africa. <laughs> then another question, um, Gary Thompson, I think you've given us some stats and I see Gary's there with his camera on, so I see he's not shy. Let me ask him to unmute and he can just uh, tell us some of the information. Looks very interesting and I'm sure his voice is better than mine. Uh, <laughs> asking you to unmute, Gary. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, Bruce, uh, just a question. Um, just in the last quarter, we caught about 754 fish in Carmouth. That's the recreational anglers. Uh, about 41% of those were released because of bag limits um, uh, and people don't then, you know, keep the fish. So there's about nearly half the fish are released back into the ocean. And the stats that we have, about 1% of that is actually released, uh, we have been tagged. So of the 754 fish, only about 1% have been uh, tagged. The, the, what, what worries me is that, you know, we are releasing fish or the anglers are releasing fish without tagging them. Um, and how do we get these guys to tag more fish? Uh, I, I've heard your comment about the costs of these tags. I understand that there are, is a responsibility that comes with tagging. Uh, can the clubs, uh, like the Carmel Ski Boat Club, for instance, contribute to the cost of those tags? Uh, and how do we get, or do you need more taggers? And if so, how do we get these guys involved? I'm going to unmute. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Um, it's a good question. Um, I th the way I want to answer it is that, you know, we've we've been approached um, over and over and over again um, by fishing organisations, particularly clubs and and fishing associations, unions, asking us, please, can we can we help? Um, please, can you give us tags, and we will then give our members and our our, our anglers the tags, and they'll and then we'll send the information to you, and I. Uh, I, I mean, literally from, from 1984, we've had these kind of requests. We have tried and tried and tried and always failed um, to work through um, fishing clubs and, and organizations, um, you know, that do the tagging work on our behalf. And as a consequence, we have uh, made it a, a policy that we will, we will only deal with individual anglers because that's the only way to ensure that um, I give you, Joe, the tags, and then, Joe, you send us what fish you've tagged with it and if any of your fish get recaptured. But otherwise, those tags disappear and the information never comes back to us and it, it just becomes um, a problem. So that's that's the issue there. So we, we, we would prefer, um, in fact, we, we only want to deal with individual um, taggers that are approach us. But what the clubs and the organizations can do is is to encourage their members to join the tagging project and, and to become individual members. Um, and certainly, you know, it would, it would really help um, if, if there were more 
um, anglers that were tagging their fish rather than than just releasing. So um, if if the angling club itself wanted to make um, a donation towards the the ori tagging project, that that would certainly um, help us uh, financially. And a number of of individuals and clubs have done that in in the past um, to assist us. So I, I think that's that's sort of one one way that I, I would suggest. Um, but certainly the the organised angling um, unions and uh, associations can can do a lot by informing their members um, about the project and 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 the the importance of it gary do you have um kind of known taggers within your club um that you know would, would be happy to either teach the other people maybe that's a an option i'm not sure Uh, we we'll definitely try and encourage people to uh, tag and release fish as much as possible. I think we sort of promote it every month on, a, on our monthly newsletter. Uh, what disturbs me um, as the chairman of the club is that the guys are still releasing the fish without tagging them. And I, I don't understand the common sense of releasing a fish without a tag in it. If it's going to survive, it'll survive. If it's not going to survive, you know, then why release it? It, 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 it just doesn't make sense. And I'm, I'm actually struggling to understand why less people want to, or why there's no sort of enthusiasm. And that's, that's the question I have in my mind. So, so, I mean, I think from what you're saying, the reason that they're releasing it is because they're over the limit in terms of their bag. So, yeah. Sorry, Gary, I think you muted. Yeah, I think that is the main reason. The guys have got to their bag limit and then they just release the fish and I'm trying to encourage them to tag it before they release it and I just can't get that message through. I mean, uh, just a question. I'm not a fisherman, so I don't know. But I mean, if they literally put those in buckets of water or whatever the case is and you had a resident tagger who then picked up all those um, ones that would be due to be released and, and, and tagged them on their behalf, would that be a viable thing or is it kind of uh, a crazy idea um, in, a, in a peak fishing season or to, to answer that is most of the guys are out of deep sea and they ski boat so you can't keep them for long uh, and as Bruce said earlier we try and get those fish back as soon as possible back into the water um, so yeah that well, that wouldn't be practical the only way is to get the guys to to get their tagging kits I think yeah, yeah I've had a lot of um, sorry Marty, I've had uh, thanks Gary um, yeah, I've had a lot of chairmen um, approach me with exactly this, asking um, to get a tagging kit for the club. And as Bruce mentioned, it just hasn't worked in the past. So um, I've encouraged the chairman or other members of the club who have approached me just to get um, a bunch of a list of guys' names together. And then um, I give them my email address or I give them the link to the um, application form on the website to apply. And a lot of the time, the guys, they're keen. But as soon as it comes to putting in the effort to actually um, write a motivation and um, fill out an application form, they just lose interest. Um, so that's what I've seen in the past is guys are keen initially, but as soon as it comes to doing the admin side of things, then they, yeah, they, they kind of lose, lose interest or yeah, it just passes their mind. Um, so, to, yeah. To add to that, thanks, Gareth. I, I, you know, really, we, we, we don't want to force people into doing this, it, it has to come from them. It has to be their interest, their initiative that that they want to join and they want to learn something because because otherwise, um, you know, that the the information that we're going to get is going to lose its quality very quickly if it's it's being forced on people. So this this is a a citizen science project where you know our our members are, are actively wanting to to help and learn. So yeah, I wouldn't like it to see it being a forced thing. Hmm. 100%. Yeah. Thanks, Gary, um, for your question. Just, just one of the questions that I had. Um, in terms of the spaghetti tags, have you kind of found them in unexpected places? I mean, um, the other the other gentleman mentioned um, a, a fish in Michigan that suddenly had a tag. But I was wondering about, you know, a fish eat fish. 
So instead of it being on the outside of the fish where you would expect it, it's now in the guts of another fish or a seabird or some other weird and wonderful place. Uh, maybe tell us some stories about some of the adventures that tags have, have, have gone on. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I've got a longer, a longer history, Gareth, so I'll start. But uh, yeah, we've had so many, so many amazing, amazing stories. Um, I think one of the funniest ones was, was um, a guy in Ponderland who, who caught a tag fish and he didn't know what it was, um, but thought it was really unique. So he used it as an earring. Um, and he put it through his through his ear. <laughs> he had the, had the fish tag in his ear, uh, which was quite a cool story. Um, yeah, another one that comes to mind was um, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, uh, an old scallywag that that used to be a spear fisherman in the Durban area. Um, uh, one of our potato uh, it was a brindle bass um, was released from the old Durban aquarium, and and it was tagged when it was was released. Um, and in those days, even it was a prohibited species. So spear fishermen and fishermen weren't allowed to, to catch or shoot these, these fish. If they did catch them, they had to release them immediately. Um, anyway, this um, brindle bass was released in off veggies in front of Durban there. And uh, yeah, it disappeared very, very quickly. Um, only a, for a few years later to have this tag sent to us saying, oh, this, this brindle bass has been caught in the harbor in Volfus Bay. Um, it was absolute nonsense. We knew it was nonsense. And we knew <laughs> that, that, that that fish had been shot short, shortly after it had been released at, <laughs> at veggies. But uh, yeah, all, all sorts of amazing stories. I don't know if you can think of some more, Gareth. Um, yeah, also we've had um, quite a few tags reported to us uh, by the guys at KZN in Sharks Board. Um, it's often when they... Uh, Get a shark in their nets and the shark has unfortunately um passed they take it back to the lab and they dissect um the shark and do stomach gut contents and stuff and often they found um tags inside the stomach contents of sharks which is quite interesting um obviously we can't get the true movement patterns of a or movement of that fish but yeah it's still quite cool when these guys report a recapture from the guts of a of a shark or something that they caught in their nets yeah cool and i mean again one shark with maybe 40 tags, you know who's the greedy guy in the, in, in the sea. Yeah. <laughs> I see Johan's got his hand up. I actually want to ask, I see Ryan Daly is in, in the meeting and he did a fascinating talk on uh, bull shark migration. So I was just wondering if your projects ever um, crossed paths or crossed currents, something like that. <laughs> uh, is, Ryan, is Ryan in the audience? Maybe he can speak for himself. Ryan is in the audience. We can ask him to. Uh, Ryan Daly, I'll see if I can unmute him. I um, have the pleasure of working with Gareth and, and Bruce closely. And yeah, it's been fascinating to build on the tag and recapture data that has come from the RE tagging project. Um, and, and the acoustic tagging just goes hand in hand with the, the, the tag and release data that we get from the, from the tagging project. And fascinating for me is, you know, with acoustic tags and satellite tags, all these other expensive means of finding out where fish go, what they do, we've been able to find out a lot more about the migrations of the fish and particularly the return migrations, particularly in cases where fish may not be caught, we still be able to detect tags where we put satellite tags or acoustic tags on them. So for example, a bull shark, well, a couple of bull sharks have been across to Madagascar. That's great because no one is reporting our, you know, RE tags from Madagascar, particularly, but we're able to unlock these, these new inf information. But <clears throat> I think what the the RE tagging project has has really done is engage with, with the angling public and give a hands on information to those that put the tag out. You know, it's so often Gareth and Bruce will let an angler know about a tag recapture on a bull shark, for example, that has been at liberty for 10 years and they remember clearly when they tag the fish or the shark and, and really helps them to buy into the, the research and the understanding of where these fish go, the understanding that these bull sharks, for example, live for over 50 years, you know, and, and that, you know, they've got to buy into to what they catch and, and there's a, a real hands-on 
I guess, want to, to conserve what they're catching so they can keep catching them and, and conserve it for future generations. So I think more than the, the satellites and acoustic telemetry that we've been doing, this traditional tagging project engages the angling community and I think is one of the biggest strengths of the project. Thanks, Ryan. Fascinating answer. Cool, guys. Um, there was one more um, question in the chat. Um, I think it was linked, or well, not linked, it was just uh, opposite to the um, the question of, have you got any records going up to Gambia? It says, do you collaborate with Kenyan anglers to Im improve migratory fish movements? Um, and that's yeah, up in Kenya. Uh, you said that you've got um, some records even beyond, but is there some sort of official collaboration or um, spreading of your project to Kenya. I mean, sorry, uh, that was from Rupi Mangat. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the African Bullfish um, Foundation in, in Kenya. Um, they do focus on tagging bullfish species, um, but we do have um, fairly good collaboration with them. So if any of the, their fish moved south and were caught by our, our anglers, we would let them know and, and vice versa but it, it's more on those highly migratory bullfish species. And, and I'm sure if um, tuna would be the same, the same story, if, if they caught ours or we caught theirs, we would let them know. So there is some uh, collaboration in that regard with regard to the, the highly migratory species, yes. Okay, awesome. I think that was the last of the chats and uh, or questions in the chat. Um, let me just quickly see. Uh, there's a, a couple of comments here. Um, Gordon Marchant um, said, I'm an ORE tagger for 10 years now. I had a recapture some years back of a dagger head that was recaptured in Johannesburg, only to find out that it was caught by a commercial angler, sold, and the recapture reported by the fishmonger in, the, in Johannesburg who bought the fish. That was an odd one. So it adds to yeah. your story. <laughs> yeah, I've had a few where guys have phoned me from the fish shop saying, hey, I got a recapture, but it was in the shop. What was this? And I was like, interesting. So yeah, I do get some really cool recaptures like it as well. And, and uh, I'd asked earlier, in, in any bird species, I mean, I, I guess your minimum size precludes quite a few of the birds. Um, but have you had any records within birds' stomachs that have been, I mean, it's amazing how many other things you find in albatross's stomachs. I mean, yeah. and there's quite a few talks about that. It's actually scary, the amount of plastic and stuff. So at least a tag. I haven't heard used. of a tag being caught, um, well, reports from a bird stomach. Um, BQ, have you heard of anything? Uh, I've got a lovely image in, in my mind as you ask that question, Marty, is that uh, I recall um, tagging a, a little gray grunter um, up in this Mangalisa wetland park north of Cape Vidal. Um, and as I released my fish, um, it, was, it was sort of swimming out um, into deeper water and a, a fish eel came over my head and, and mm -hmm. stooped down and grabbed the, grabbed the gray grunter and then took it up into the tree. So my attempt to <laughs> track the gray grunter got eaten by a fish eagle. So, but yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know of any others. <laughs> When you thought, oh dear, there's five bucks of tag, we went up in the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, when I was growing up, my I think it was my grand used to t teach us this thing. I hope I get it right. The wonderful bird is a pelican. His beak can hold more than his belican, mm -hmm. and then it carries on somewhere along there. So I can yeah. imagine a few pelicans catching a few um, a yeah. few large large enough fish to tag. Um, there's a, a Dawn Boshoff says a bit, a bit off topic, but talking about finding tags and sharks, any reason for the increase of shark and loosing fish to sharks off the KZN coast at the moment? Yo, that's a that's a big that's a big subject um, and a difficult one to answer. Um, Ryan is, is probably equally well qualified to answer it. We have tried to publish some art, some articles in the Ski Boat magazine about it. Um, we've tried to do a, a project getting fishermen to record um, fish being taken. You know, when you hook, hook a lionfish um, and you're reeling it in and the shark comes and eat, eats it to try and record this for us, but it, it hasn't been very successful, um, but certainly um, anecdotally speaking to fishermen, there are 
a lot more sharks around now that are taking um, fishermen's catch. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for it, but probably one of the most important is, um, as Ryan mentioned, these, these animals live for a long time. So bull sharks, dusky sharks can live up to 50 years. Um, and these animals are not stupid. They, they're sentient beings, they can learn. Um, and basically a lot of our sharks have be, become conditioned um, to associate um, a ski boat, the sound of the motors um, with food. Um, because very quickly when that, when that boat comes past and if it stops, if it's at anchor, um, shortly thereafter, their fish wriggling on, on a line, that's like a, a trigger, like a Pavlov's dog. You know, they're gonna come there and they're gonna feed on that easy prey. Um, and that's been happening for the last hundred years in, in KZN waters that, you know, we've been fishing, but they're just more and more um, boats, more and more fishermen. And hence, um, I think the problem with shark predation has grown and it's not unique to South Africa. Um, you find it in East Coast of America, you find it in West, West Coast of Australia. Um, there are many instances where um, this type of conditioning has happened. Um, and it's a very difficult one to solve. Um, you know, what do we do about it? Well, we obviously can't go and fish out the sharks because they, they're causing a problem. They're taking our fish. And, uh, and I understand that the, the, the fishermen's anger and frustration at, at losing fish, but, um, you know, sharks are really, really in, in deep trouble globally. And they, they're important uh, predators in the ecosystem and we really need our sharks. Um, so the solution is, is really to try and find ways of, of kind of avoiding this, this kind of overlap. So what we encourage anglers to do is to move. You know, if, if, you, if you have sharks under your boat and they're taking your fish, then try and move far enough away and find a new area. But um, yeah, it's a problem. Um, and uh, particularly in the summer months, we find that, you know, when the kuta come down, yes, the guys battle to, to, to boat their fish. But I don't know if Ryan would like to, to add anything to that. I think we'll have to try and unmute Ryan quickly. Let me just find him. He jumped there. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, you got me. <laughs> thanks, buddy. No, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, uh, Dwayne, uh, just to echo what Bruce is saying, the, uh, I think often there's a, um understanding that there's so many sharks, they're all eating the fish, you know, but as Bruce said, it could be a small handful of sharks that are just so acute into, uh, you know, eating the fish from from boats, especially at popular sites. I mean, I'm sure as you know, well, there's some sites, especially over summer, that you get a lot of tax more than other sites. These are sites where the sharks are, often the sharks are with the fish. So often you'll have this weird bias where you're catching more fish, you're getting more tax, but the sharks obviously want to be where the fish are too. So you've got this sort of build up effect where I'm catching more fish. The sharks have learned, like Bruce said, about the easy meal associated with the boats or kayak and they straight on you straight away when you hook that fish. And I've seen it firsthand doing drifts when you spear fishing up and down a mark it's the same exact shark that follows you up and down even if you do a kilometer run up sort of from a, a reef that same shark's following the boat up and following you down following the boat up following you down so it, it may not be that there's more sharks it just may be that the sharks are, are more cued into taking fish from boats as Bruce said, in Australia, they've done some interesting studies where they've taken um, sort of genetic swabs of the bitten fish so they can identify the species of shark. And it definitely is a, a, a number of, of shark species in summer, as you know, obviously our sub black tips, our bull sharks that are taxing the fish. It, it is a challenge, but um, rest assured, KZN has one of the best shark culling programs in the country, if not the world. So <laughs> I don't think there's anything more we can really do, but yeah, just to to respect the the sharks when when they're around and and move on and when you can. But yeah, we understand it is is frustrating, especially when you're losing nice fish, and especially when your bag limit might be ten and you catching twenty fish, losing nineteen to sharks. It it, it is a challenge, and and I, I guess we just have to work around it. Thanks for that comment, and uh, I think we need to end off. Um, the guys have been talking for a long time, but there's one last comment from. 
Steve McCurra, which I'd like to just end off with. So um, he mentions every project will have its detractors, but without doubt, the knowledge gained by your, this science overrides any negatives. Many thanks for your presentation style, and I don't want to call it dumbing down, but you have made the program so interesting and tangible for the layperson and fisherman. Thank you so much, and well done. So thanks. I think Great. that caps up thanks, all of Steve. our... Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, sir. All right. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, night, everyone. Everybody. Thanks for thanks attending. And yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Cheers. Yes. And thanks, Johan and Moritz and the team for the opportunity and everything. Yeah, we'll be sure to catch you guys around.